Well, church family, um, I'm preaching today, and um, if you missed it a few weeks ago, we announced I'm taking a sabbatical starting in about a week or so. Uh, we'll be here next Sunday, of course, and, um, and, uh, but um, this, this week, as I was just preparing for today, um, I just wanted to, just saying, God, what is it you want me to share today for our church. Um, I won't be preaching for a while. So what can I leave them with? What can I leave you with uh, here over the next several months? And um, I just sensed he was highlighting just really uh, a couple of passages and then just to share with you a couple of hopes and dreams, if you will, um, for what I'm believing for, for you, for us as a church. Um, and for those that are college students, some will be here over the summer working and summer school, but many of you will be gone or in and out. Um, my hope is the same for you. If you're present here in this city or at your own, uh, at a local church in your hometown or somewhere else, I would still have this same prayer for all of our uh, K through 12 students. This would be my heart for them, for our young adults, for our families, for um, everyone that that we would, as the Antioch family, be a people who would be about these things I'm going to share today. And um, and you know sometimes it's hard to look at this and kind of man. All right, well, wh- what do we pick to do today? You know, like what am I going to focus on today? Uh, I mean, last week I. I gave you my best heart and effort about why children are awesome. And um, if you weren't here, I encourage you to listen to it. If you've got a, uh, an ax to grind against children, you should probably listen to last Sunday's message so you can repent quickly and turn your life around before it goes south. Um, but we are pro-children around here. And uh, that was last week, though, and we're still pro-children, but today... I just thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to learn from Jesus a little bit here and share with you something that hopefully will stick, that'll remain. Um, the first passage I want to read to you is Mark chapter 4, verse 30 through 34. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and put out large branches so that the birds of the air can make a nest in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Verse 34, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. He explained everything to his disciples. Um, this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And in Mark chapter 4, this statement to his disciples, to his own disciples, he explained everything. If you notice with the ministry of Jesus, he did a lot of parables, right? He did a lot of storytelling, um, meaning Jesus taught in principles most of the time. Now, contrast that with what um, in the Old Testament, and even in that day and age when Jesus stepped in to um, uh, in, into that reality of what was happening in Israel, most people were not necessarily taught in principles and parables. What we best can gather is they were taught in very rigid laws and rule structures and ordinances, right? Um, and in many ways, when God gave the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel before they stepped in the Promised Land, remember, Mount Sinai, right? Moses goes up to the mountain, this crazy scene, thunder, God speaks, tablets, right? You got these Ten Commandments, right? And all of a sudden, bring it down. The people are worshiping this golden calf. Moses just, you know, it's like baseball bat with the stones. Just, just forget it, so frustrated. I can't believe you guys have already turned away from God. I've only been up there for a few weeks, you know. I mean, come on, man. It's like, you guys already turn, right? And, but so here's the Israelites. They always had this leaning to turn away from God and God keeps loving them and calling them back saying, hey, come on, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one who loves you. 
And so then they go through the whole journey, get to the promised land. And in that season, and you look at, and if you read Deuteronomy or Leviticus, there's all these different laws and ordinances and things they had to do and rules, right? And so they now are in this place and you have Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, these religious leaders that are instructing and teaching the people and the high priest how to live a godly life. But what they did was they took the 10 commandments plus, I believe it was about 600 plus other specific things in the Mosaic law that people had to do to be in right standing with God. 600 plus. Wow, that's a long list. Right? Imagine waking up every day. Okay, let's read through the 600 things today. <laughs> Woo, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have a day. You'd still be reading. And you'd be like, oh, it's nighttime. Go to bed. I mean, start again, right? I mean, it's literally impossible, but that's what people are used to. They were used to wash like this, say this, walk like this, do this, have a beard link like this, ladies wear this, don't do this. When you, when you touch a cow, you should do that. You know, all these different things. You're like, there's a lot of odd rules around here, right? But everything was bent towards the holiness of God, people who were holy unto him. But like we still do today, we can always take something and then kind of expand and add our stuff to it, yeah. right? So the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, those that were leaders of the people, they kind of just added to, right? It's like a little, tamand, a little Ten Commandments plus. So they added to it. And they made it very ridiculous in some ways, right? I don't have time to go through all of them, but they kind of made it ridiculous. And so Jesus steps on the scene, and he witnesses and knows, right? He's like, wow, there's a lot of crazy stuff. There's like a lot of crazy rules going on and stuff, but they're missing the heart. They've missed the heart. They just they keep trying to throw band-aids on an open wound that's not going to heal. And so Jesus steps in and he starts teaching in parables and principles. And I believe because what he was trying to communicate was, guys, it's not just about understanding how to do just this one thing. It's about applying a principle of the kingdom that then is applicable to everything. Right? So like that's why he says things like, hey, love your enemies. Right? Well, if you want to be religious about it, well, who's my enemy? You? Not you, right? Because I don't have to love you because you're not my enemy. But, uh, right? And so all of a sudden, now we're trying to find the line or the box of what's, well, what's an enemy? Because I'm only, but all of a sudden it's like, wait a second. Or love your neighbor. It's like, whoa, who's my neighbor? Right? This is what we want to do. Even today we're like, who's my neighbor? Because can I get away with not loving him or her? Because have you seen them? Have you seen what they They never take their trash out. They are loud on Saturday night. I mean, do I have to love them? It's the only people who deserve to be loved because a real, a good neighbor, right? A really good, okay, love them. But all of a sudden, Jesus starts teaching in principles and parables because he's trying to cut through all the facade and say, hold on, it's about, is there a core issue here? There's a core issue of the heart. And so I love that he says, but it says, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything, but to the general public, to the people, he spoke in parables. Why am I making a point about that? <laughs> because if you want to be a true disciple of Jesus, then you have to lean in and inquire and ask. I don't think his disciples sat there and heard the same parable. It's great. Got it. Check. I think Peter was like, hey, so what, what was that again? Can you talk about that? Uh, I want to unpack that. I think sitting around the fire, eating some nice tilapia or whatever they had out of the Red Sea, whatever they're fishing. Was, hey, can I ask James? Hey, can you, can you tell me a little more about that, Jesus? Because I don't. And he was able to explain because he had relationship. Right? So like Jesus to many people, to the crowds, he was a great speaker. A great community. Oh, man, that Jesus. Yeah. Woo. Have you shaken his hand? No, but man, have you heard that? Have you heard that boy talk? I mean, he can talk. Have you heard the miracles he's doing? Oh, those miracles. Yeah. They're like, do you know him? Have you shared a meal with him? Have you heard him laugh? Have you seen him cry? What about a firm handshake? You had one of those? Oh, because now we're talking about Jesus. We know him. There's relationship. I think he revealed everything to his disciples because they leaned in. They leaned in. I hope for me, for this church, is we would lean into him. Don't, don't say you, you love Jesus without leaning in. Don't take the label of Christian and just say, I'm just part of a club. That's not the way. The way is a leaning in. I've said it before. You can choose to be part of the crowd if you want to. 
And Jesus will love the crowd. He will bless the crowd. He will do miracles, signs and wonders for the crowd. You could be a follower, which means you're only gonna go so far until the road gets tough. A little persecution, a little, oh, that's difficult, a little tough decision you gotta make in business. You know, the integrity meter starts going off. Ah, oh, man, you know, come on, Jesus. Help me out. A little blessing here, you know. But a disciple is costly. Disciple is, and I've chosen to live a narrow way. The most who are unwilling to live and most in the church are unwilling to live. Period. Most want to be part of the club and the benefits of the club. A, the benefits of a disciple is giving your life for him. That's what it is. The, the, the benefits in this world, but man, they're immense and eternal Amen. and glorious in heaven. A, a disciple's not looking for their inheritance on earth. They're looking for it in heaven. Does that make sense? Everybody else is looking for their inheritance now. I want me, mine now. A true disciple's like, I don't care what I get on earth. That's not my concern. And actually, probably the less I get on earth is actually better there. It's a mentality switch. So I want us to be those that would be said of us privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. Now let's move on to Mark chapter 12. That's where we're going to hang in or zone in today. Uh, Mark 12, 28 through 34. As you're turning there, I just want to give you context for Mark 12. We're not going to read through all of it, but I was listening to it on my drive here this morning, just listening to Mark 12. And I was thinking to myself, I think that I missed the fact that in Mark 12, literally, it's these different groups come at him. Um, because Jesus starts out speaking in a parable about this vineyard, right, that this owner had, and he, and he gave the tenants to, to actually take care of it. But then the owner was like, hey, I want to I wanna send someone, uh, a, a messenger, a servant, so they can go and get some fruit from this, from this vineyard, from this farmland, right? And he comes, and they reject him. Then the next one comes, and they beat him. The next one comes, they kill him. Then more came, and they kept beating them, killing them. And, and Jesus is sharing this parable, and there's Pharisees, and there's scribes, and there's Sadducees, and there's his disciples, and there's others all listening to this. And they're like, this sounds strangely familiar. Like, God gave this to this people, a promised land, this place that could be like milk and honey and fruitful. And then the people turned and he sent prophets and he sent others along to say, hey, this is how we got to turn back to God. We're going to beat you. We're going to kill you and get rid of you. And then God finally sent, it says this parable, he sent his son, right? His beloved son, aka Jesus, right? So um, he comes and then they killed him too. And so the, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, all hear this. And they're just like, we know you're talking about us. You know what I'm saying? It's like, let's, let's go, draw your sword. You know, we're, we know, we know, we know what you're saying. That's not just a parable, it's about us. It's like, yes, Einstein, yes, it's absolutely about you. What you've done in the, for generations before. So then they come after him, right? The Pharisees come after him, try to trip him up, Right? Then the Sadducees come after him, try to trip him up. Then this lone little scribe shows up. I like this guy. Verse 28, and one of these scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now let's pick it up in verse 30. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is, the, he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. He didn't have a microphone, but if he did, he just would have dropped the mic right there, wouldn't he? 
Now, this is an action-packed passage here, but I want to point out a couple of things. Um, number one, you have to know that a scribe in Jerusalem <clears throat> was one who had learned the Jewish law. He was a religious teacher, which means he knew it as good as anybody. And as I said earlier, the Mosaic law contained over 600 commands. So this scribe, knowing the Mosaic law, and probably knowing all 600 or close to that, asked Jesus a question, but different than the others, his question seems to be genuinely trying to understand. The Sadducees and Pharisees were trying to trip him up. But this guy's like, I've heard them disputing, but this Jesus, he's got great answers. I know the law. What's the best one? Like, I don't think he was trying to trip up Jesus. I don't know the guy, but I think he was generally seeking out. He was generally hungry for what Jesus could give. There's a difference in us as people. You're coming to Christ either just for a benefit or just for a blessing or you're trying to prove something about yourself or you're coming to learn, surrender, and be hungry. He's looking around the earth for those that are willing to come under him and learn. He's looking for disciples to say, hey, can you explain that to me? I don't understand. I don't imagine Jesus would have just blown them off if they come with humble hearts. Hey, let me help you. Because you're supposed to be like children in faith, right? No sane adult who has half a heart is going to blow off a little child who's like, can you tell me, is it my right foot or left foot? I mean, if you ever coach you sports, you want to coach him? <laughs> Classic. All right, stretch. Reach down the right leg. Your other right. You know, it's just, it's every time. Doesn't matter. It's like, you know, it's, hey, your other right. It's okay, I'm teaching you, you know? All right, so the scribe is coming with this humble heart. And remember that Jesus is quoting here Deuteronomy 6, which probably everyone listening is like, hey, like, this guy knows the law. So let me read for you Deuteronomy 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So he's literally quoting Deuteronomy 6 as the scribe is asking, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And this is what he quotes. Case in point, I'm hoping that we are people who know the word. That's your defense. Your defense is not your opinions. You will get cut to pieces, y'all. Your arguments will be laid waste. People who stand on anything but him and the word, you will be brought low. But Jesus never got backed in a corner. He had the word. Even when he fought the devil in the desert, what did he do? He brought the word. It's the sword. It is offensive so therefore, the word is offensive to those who don't understand. Yeah. Just as Jesus just offended the Sadducees and Pharisees with his responses of the word. They're offended. So just get used to it. The Bible is offensive because it offends our pride. Does it make any sense? It is true. But it's because we don't want to surrender to it. And because we're Americans and Texans and uber independent. Yeah, tell what to do. You know, it's like to wrangle us. It's like, I'm not going to get in line and do that. I'm going to form my own line. I mean, that's how we are. And there's some good things about that. And, but in Christ, that's not good. It's get in line. One king. One Lord. I don't really care what you feel about it or what you think about it. It is what it is. So there's a lot of things I understand about God. I just chose a long time ago. He's God and I'm not. I don't care if I, I don't have to understand it to do it. If we go with that philosophy, then all of a sudden my kids aren't going to obey anything. Why can't I drive your car at five? Why can't I put my hand in the fire? It's like, okay, I just tell you, don't put your hand in the fire. But if they're three, they're like, I need you to explain it to me in three-year-old terms. Wow, my child won't have a hand. It'll be melted, right? So no, I'm okay with that. That's how we raise our children. We are like children. That's how we are raised by God. God, I trust you. I want to learn more. I want to have things revealed to me. But golly, I don't have to know it all to, to, to trust you and to obey you. But let's, be, but let's look at this. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. We know that. He's quoting there. But this is that famous passage going back to raising children. Verse 6 through 9. This is right after he says that. 
with all your soul, with all your might. Then he goes on, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your ears. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Yes, I know the context was thousands of years ago, but here's the point, right? Don't get stuck in the, in the frontlets. It's like, what frontlets, you know? right? Uh, don't, don't get stuck there. What is the point? The point is 24-7. I want you talking about the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 24-7, I want you talking about you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your might, right? Like that's the point is that we raise our families like that And the point is that in community, as a church family, that's how we are to be raised under the Lord. We talk about how we are loving him and giving him our all. That's what we talk about, right? And if we make that part of our conversation day to day, and that's part of our correction to one another or to our children, all of a sudden it makes sense. Because when I tell my kids, hey, I am... I am getting on to you about this thing so that you can learn how to honor God the Father. I'm your earthly father. I'm not God, I'm your earthly father, but I'm teaching you how to respect and honor authority on earth with me and mom because I want you to get in line with understanding the authority that God has. But if I do not raise my children to fear me in a healthy way and have a reverent sense of, of, of respect and authority for me and for Ashley, that is a problem for them as they become an adult and get off to college. You usually don't see a lot of problems with people that are raised in that way because they establish a clear authority. So when it comes time to following God, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. It's not like, I mean, I don't really remember because I was, I was blessed to have that growing up. I don't remember having a lot of rebelliousness with God. I was like, it's just understood. He is who he is, and I'm little old me. I never really questioned that. I got it, right? And, and my parents weren't like harsh with me. I wasn't like beaten as a kid. I know some of you are thinking, oh my gosh. What is it? It's like, no, I have a healthy respect for my parents. I saw them this weekend. They're great, you know? It's like, we're good. But they raised me in a way that I ultimately, not for their benefit, but for my benefit unto him. Do you see? You you need vision for parenting. You raise your kids such a way so that they will actually make it simpler for them to know God and obey him. Because that's an eternal perspective of parenting. Earthly perspective is, I just need to have control and make my family look nice for pictures and everyone get off my, and it's not, no, no, I don't care about that. I care about pleasing him. Not everybody else. Does it make sense? So here we go. He's taking, he's summing it up to the scribe, the entire law, big statement here in Mark 12, but it's tied in to that way that we raise our families. But did you notice when Jesus said that in Mark 12, that um, the greatest commandment as he responds to the scribe does not actually start with loving God, does it? What's it start with? Here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Actually, the greatest commandment starts with hear that he is one. Now, why is that important? Um, Because if we don't understand the principle to, um, let me put it this way, we can't really obey him fully if we don't know him. Now we're talking about just like that blind obedience. And that's okay, but what's better is like obeying who you know, right? And so if you know, hero Israel, our Lord, our God is one. He is, he is the one true God. He is the most high God. That's, you need to know that he is there, right? You look at the 10 commandments, right? The first ones there are about him. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm the Lord, your God. Like he establishes that before we get into murdering and stealing, which we always reference, The main ones are what? He is one. Because if you don't get that, the rest of them are not going to play out very well. It's either I'm surrendered to one God, 
period. There are no other gods and there will be no other false idols in my life. Then I can get on with honoring mother and father, get on with not stealing and not, that's great. But you miss those pieces, you miss it. I think Jesus is referencing that in many ways, the 10 commandments of which the scribe and the people there certainly knew. He's saying, reminder, God, hear him, know him. Therefore, then if you know him, then guess what? You can love him. You can love who you know. So he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Um, you know what I'm hoping for for our church? That by the time we get to December of 2023, that we could look at each other in the face and say, hey, I'm doing that. And I was just reading back through this again, and uh, love, as he's describing it, is not a feeling. It's not, this is not a feeling. This is a doing. He, he's, he's not saying just feel like you love God. There's, there's nothing measurable with that, right? It's just, well, I'm, no, but... He talks about a demonstration in the New Testament many times, right? A demonstration of his power. You will know them by the way they love one another, like my true disciples, right? This is the, like, how do you know the love of God? He sent his only son to be sacrificed. Like, love has to do with action. Does it make any sense? And I know we live in a day and age, right? I'm not saying you can't have lovey feelings toward, um, okay? But just to be clear, when we're talking about Jesus summing up the entire law, you don't see him talking about our feelings and our emotions about it. What we see is him saying, um, I need you to love God with your entire being, like all of you. Which means in our day and age, it starts like here in our belief and in our, in our inner being. And then that then bubbles up to our mind. So then we had this thought that's either holy or unholy, righteous or unrighteous, encouraging or discouraging, good or evil, slanderous or, I mean, right? Like this is, it's here, and then it's, woo, gets in my mind. Maybe I should utter that in the English language or another language, right? So it starts here. And so what he's saying is, I need you to love me with everything you have. And guys, we live in a day and age to where there is no check on this. I was talking to someone just a couple of days ago and they were saying it is unbelievable and they're in a certain industry and job and they said, it's unbelievable the amount of disrespect that I get from the younger generation. It is unbelievable. I've talked to many teachers. Any teachers in the room? Um, I won't call you out, but I'm pretty sure from the teachers that I know, uh, respect is not on the rise to teachers. Uh, Maybe we need to bring that old paddle back. I got paddled in fourth grade, just you know. <laughs> Let me say, you get paddled once? Hey, fourth grade, I got paddled once. I never got paddled again. <laughs> it works. Just saying. It worked on me, at least. That's what I could say. It got, it got me in line. But I'm just saying, there's not a respect. Like, that's not growing. It's decreasing. Yeah. Like, a th- respect for authority. Therefore, if respect for authority is on the, de- uh, is on the decrease, how much more for God? Who do, you, who do you know that's like, man, yeah, let's talk about the fear of the Lord. That's exciting. I don't hear people talking about that. I did talk about that some in college. My buddies, though, how are we going to fear God? Because he's ever watching. He is present. I acknowledge him. There's a respect, a reverence there that we lack. And I'm telling you, you do not want to lack the fear of the Lord in your life. You don't. It is love and fear. It is love me and fear me at the same time. It is a both and. He is mighty God. He's not just your buddy. He's not your genie in the lamp. He is the almighty, the holy one, the holy of holies. And when Jesus Christ returns, he is coming back holy and majestic and filled with fire in his eyes. He will be feared. People will not be high-fiving Jesus in that day. You won't. It'd be like, whoa. I know some of you guys probably watch old King Charles over there. Some of you watched it yesterday, probably, if you got up at 5 a.m. or something. Um, you know, I know it's interesting and all that stuff, but I'm like, 
just t- take that little sampling of what people try to do and the reference and that whole thing and that ceremony you now, just take it up 10,000, you know? And, but I'm, it just, we don't have an understanding of that. And man, what I want for us as a people is to love him with everything we have. Because if, if we don't do that, it's, it's we miss. Amen. It's a swing and a miss. <laughs> you know, like, if, if, if you're not willing to give God your whole heart, I, I think that we're teetering in that same category. Let's just follow a few rules and few laws and make ourselves feel better. And that's not what Jesus came for. He died for all of you. He died, he died for your whole being. He died so that you could have life and have freedom and run the race he's called you to run. So we've got to love him with our whole being. It starts here, and then it surfaces up to our mind, and then it comes out of our words and our actions, right? And, and um, my, my encouragement to us is this. Um, no matter where you're working, no matter what you're doing in school, no matter society, I don't care if you feel like it's getting darker or brighter or whatever else. Um, to me, that's irrelevant. It's about you taking your responsibility taking ownership of your faith and saying, if I'm going to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, then I'm going to apply his teachings in every area of my life. That includes my finances. That includes my work. That includes my schooling. That includes, yes, if you're a college student, actually studying for your exam. The way I looked at it is dishonoring to God for me. It was not about my parents paying for education and helping out. It was about, it's disrespectful to God for me to not give my 100% best effort, period. My best may have been a C. I wasn't the brightest guy, Okay but you better believe I didn't leave anything. I was serious about it in college. I worked hard, not because I wasn't there to please the professor. I wasn't gonna get summa anything. I don't know what it's called. You know, I wasn't gonna get that. I, I I wasn't top percentage of anything. I was just, but I was like, no, God gave me a brain. He gave me a brain. He gave me eyes. He gave me hands and feet and a heart that's still beating. And so therefore I'm going to give him what I can. I'll be judged by that, yeah. not a letter. Yeah. I'll be judged by my faithfulness. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is for everyone in the room. You got a job, you don't like a job, be faithful to your job until you get another one. Yeah. Remember, a thousand years ago, no one picked their jobs. Hire your dad's a blacksmith, you'll be one too. Perfect. <laughs> I hate metal, doesn't matter. <laughs> Hi, you're a rancher. Dad, you know I'm allergic to cows. Sorry. <laughs> Get over it. You're going to have to work with cows or else we're all going to die. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Dad, okay. Wow. Just, that's a side note. Just remember, we are very uh, privileged today to have choices. So those choices are not always to our benefit because then it gives us choices with God. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll obey that, not that. What do you think? I'm passionate about obeying this. Like, I'm passionate about this thing, God. But this thing I'm not real passionate about. So can we just, someone else can do that one. I'll do this one. And together, our powers combined, we'll be loving you together. <laughs> right? I'm more of a heart person. She's more of an action. Okay. No, no. It's everything. It's everything you have. That's what he's looking for, guys. This is a church. This is not a club. You know, like, if you're part of this, it's not just because you're just, you're just bored. I hope not. Like, we don't want you to be bored. Be full of life. Jesus came so you can have abundant life. That's the truth. I want that for me. I'm 40 years old. I got another half or so to go. And I want to have more abundant life in the second half than the first half. That's what I want for me, for my wife, for my kids, for this church. I want us to have a better half next. So look at this year's and say, you know what? The next half of 2023, I'm going to get in line. I'm giving him my whole heart because he deserves it. The last thing I'll just share is, um, <clears throat> he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right, again, if we ask the question, who's my neighbor, that means we're just trying to wiggle out of loving someone. And I'm not saying loving people are easy. It's a whole lot easier to love God for me with everything I've got than to love people. People are messy. People hurt you. People lie. People are manipulative. People are gossips. People are wicked. People have good intentions with bad outcomes. People... There's bad, there's good, but it's just people are messy, man. It's like we all have this dreamy scenario of Christmas with the family, and then we go, and it's like, oh, that wasn't so fun. (laughs) I expected to play a board game, everybody laughing and eating cake, and we got this big fight, you know, because 
my brother's so competitive, he won't give up. You know, it's just whatever, right? God, it's easy. It's on us. It's on you, right? It's kind of like when you're playing golf, who can you blame for a bad shot? You can't blame anybody. But on a soccer team, when you lose, baseball team, right? I mean, team sports are good. He's like, "Uh uh-oh, pointing at the finger. I was like, no, I try to tell my kids, hey, you can't control what they do. Control what you do. What could you have done differently to help your team win? But dad, but dad, no, ah, ah, no, no, no buts, right? So think of it like walking the Christian life is like you're playing golf, right, with God. But when you get into loving your neighbor, it's like team sports. It's like, oh, man, it's tough. Because this guy, I got to pick this guy up over here. He's dragging us down. Right, you may have a good week, they have a bad week, right? And so loving your neighbor is actually very challenging, but doesn't mean we're not supposed to do it. Hard things, it's okay. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God living and active in your life, I don't know if you can love your neighbor very well, be quite honest, because in our flesh, we're just, we're crazy, we'll hurt each other. God knew that, <laughs> you know? So it's like when we're filled with the Spirit, we're following the ways of Jesus, all of a sudden, it's possible. It is like I have hope it's possible to actually love somebody, to love them well. So finally, I'll just say a couple of things here, a few hopes. I'm gonna invite the band to come on up. Um, if, I was, if I was to maybe sum up some of these pieces of just saying, hey, how are we gonna love God and love one another and know that he is the Lord. Um, maybe another way I would put that, just a couple of practicals for us as a people. Um, and again, th- these are just hopes that I have for us as a church and as I take a sabbatical and, and reflect in my own life as well. But um, not, not only am I hoping for that we would take Mark 12 and just apply that to our lives, say, yeah, Lord, I'm in. I'm in to love you, whatever that means. I wanna do that fully. I don't wanna just think about it. I wanna, I wanna do it. But um, a few hopes I have is that we would be a, a church who's committed again to making disciples. And I was talking to our team about this and I think four years ago, we were really good at making disciples in 2019 and before that. So the first 10 years of the church, that was a real hallmark of this church and we were committed. And I would say most people at every age group were in discipleship relationships and we've gotten away from that some. And I think it's, it's cost us. So I told our team, I said, hey, I know I'm not gonna be here for all this stuff, but um, here's a big challenge on the table. I, I wanna make making disciples the main thing. Because if, if discipleship's actually happening in the right way, it solves 90% of the problems. R- really, like just name the issue. It's probably in discipleship when iron sharpens iron, when there's accountability, when you're getting in the word, when you've got someone fighting for you in your corner and they're fighting for you, when you're confessing your sin on a regular basis and you're, you don't have weeks to go by with hiding it when you, God, someone that loves you, cares about you, you're, you, where you know you have that true friendship going on. Oh man, you feel alive. Our church needs discipleship again. So my urge is to make disciples. Make one be one. Another hope I have is just we would be walking in holiness. This world is broken and there's a lot of wicked stuff but we are meant to be that city on a hill. That's who Christ has called the church to be, to be the light in a dark place. But we can't be that if we're just dabbling in the same stuff they are. You can't be different if you're not different. <laughs> like you have to be set apart. Like to be holy is to be set apart. Like holiness, so walking in holiness, that's why it's the Holy Spirit. There are other spirits out there, but the Holy Spirit is holy. Holy. And if he's in us, oh, we are called to walk in that same holiness. It's possible with him. The third piece would be, um, what I'm hoping for is that we would just honor one another. We would reestablish a culture of honor in this church. That we honor children. Children honor parents. College students are honoring our elders. We're honoring you. The honor is a two-way street. I'm not just asking to honor the person who's older than you. That is what I'm asking too. That there's something we need to get back to in the church 
say we have a, a reverence, a respect for those that are those who have gone before us. We don't dismiss their wisdom or dismiss their understanding or blow them off because they're not relevant or get it. They're a lot more relevant than you know. And that we would also honor downstream. That the older generation would be able to honor the younger ones. That I'd be able to look at a college student and honor them for who they are and how God's made them and not dismiss them. Because I was a college student once and I had my own quirks, but someone believed in me. We've got to believe in each other and that's part of honoring another. And the last one I'll just say, my, my last hope for us would be um, that we would have integrity. Integrity of thought. It goes back to loving the Lord your God with all you've got, right? But we have integrity in our thoughts. They're like, your thoughts matter. And that when you have a thought that is ungodly, it's not of him, that you would take captive of that thought. So Lord, I don't even want that thought to get uttered. I want to take care of it. I want to dismiss it. Lord, no, I give that to you. Thoughts will come. That's what we do with them. We'd have integrity in our thoughts and certainly in our speech. The words that we utter to one another, we would know they have weight. That God is ever watching and they have meaning. We can't just say things or write things or type things and just think it's no big deal. Amen. Right? It is either blessing or cursing. You're either speaking life or death. There's not a middle ground. Right? And so be careful what you say. God will hold you to it. And this church community should hold you to it as well. We should sharpen one another with our tongues. And with our actions, of course, we'd have integrity with our actions. That the way we do something, the way we do business, the way we treat people, the way that we open up our home for a meal, the way that we care for someone at the grocery store or out and about, the way we take care of a waiter or a waitress, like that we do that and our actions measure up. And that people in our community would be able to interact with us and say, hey, that person reminds me of somebody. Jesus. They remind me of somebody. Jesus, yeah, that's who they remind me of. That they talk like him. They, they even look like him a little bit. There's a little glow. <laughs> There's something in them that's something I don't, I don't experience anywhere else, but they experience it with you. And then there's an opportunity to share the gospel, to tell them about your story, to bring them into the kingdom. Amen? That's what I'm hoping for. So let's stand this morning as we close. Jesus, I do pray that you would, you would help us, Lord. It's not easy. It's not easy to love you with all that we've got. It's not easy to love people well. But we're asking that that would be present in this church community. We're asking, Lord, that we would be committed to making disciples more than we have in recent days. We're asking that we would be a people who walk in holiness unto you, God, or pleasing to you in our lives. God, we're asking that you would establish a culture of honor again in this house. We would honor one another, that it matters what we say and what we do. And Lord, we pray that we would increase in our integrity with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions. And that you would look upon this house and say, that is the house of the Lord. That is a place where I dwell. That's a place where I'm attracted to. I love being with those people. That's what we want, God. We selfishly want you to be present, to be near. We want to be pleasing to you. Not everybody else, but to you, God. That's our aim. That's our hope, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.